Hello, hello. Welcome back to the undergraduate seminar. We've got Ty from University of Waterloo who's going to give us a hitchhiker's guide to braids. As someone who loves string and braids and knots, I'm very excited for this talk. Take it away. Awesome. Great. Well, thanks for having me. Uh, it's nice to be here in my office. Um, I'm sorry I couldn't be there in person. I teach just before this, so it wasn't possible. But um, so first, before we get started, if there's anything at all during the talk, uh, there's there's a few people here, so I can take it in any direction you want. We can just have a discussion. It's not a big deal. Please interrupt. I don't have anything in particular I need to get to or anything like this. Please go ahead. Do not hesitate to interrupt with anything. The goal of today is I'm just going to talk about braids and um, at least the way I think about them. So without further ado, section one, braids. So what's a braid? So a braid, uh, here's a braid on three strands. I'm just going to tell you what a braid is by giving you a bunch of examples. There's a braid on three strands. Great. So all it is, is you pick three points on the plane and then like three points on a parallel copy of the plane, the same three points, and you draw strings between them. The strings aren't allowed to intersect and they're allowed to wiggle around, but with the endpoints fixed. So for example, this braid here is equal to this braid there, right? So I've sort of taken the strand behind, uh, the one that's sort of going diagonally across behind and I've dragged it around and I've done a little bit of wiggling with other things. So these, this is a braid in what's called B3, which is the three stranded braids. Three stranded braids, great. Um, here are some rules. So you have to keep in mind throughout this whole thing is that the end points the end points stay fixed at all points throughout the um sort of any manipulations you do end points stay fixed and the other thing you have to keep in mind is that um strands go down at all points strands always go down so what do I mean by this is that you can't have, you can't have this kind of thing happening. All right. So when I'm drawing my strands, they always go from top to bottom. There's no turning around. So you can't have any knotting. It turns out that this is equivalent to saying you can't have any knotting happening at all. Okay, cool. So in general, BN, is going to be what we call the braid group on n strands. So it's just a set of all sort of braid diagrams that you can draw, right, except with n strings. Great. So the integers, they come with a nice operation called addition, which eats two integers and spits out an integer and it turns the integers into a group. The braid groups also come with something, an operation, which eats two braids and spits out another braid, right? And that operation is you just grab two braids and you put one on top of the other. Right. So here's an example in B4. Right. So this is a set of four stranded braids. I could take this braid here, that's a perfectly good braid on four strands. So I'm going to take that one and I'm going to do my operation with that braid. And let's say this braid. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this braid and put it on top of this braid. 
So this equals to And to keep track of sort of where the braids were when they started, right, I can draw this dotted line across there and you can see above the dotted line, it's the first braid, below the dotted line, it's the second braid. But the important thing is that once you've sort of concatenated these braids, you put one on top of the other, um, the points which are in the middle can now move around. So they were fixed uh, on the, in the initial sort of two braids, the top of the second one and the bottom of the first one were fixed, but now once they concatenated, I can move these points around around the middle as much as I'd like. Okay, so that's an operation. It eats two four-stranded braids and it spits out four-stranded braids. And in general, it, it, this operation eats two n-stranded braids and it spits out an n-stranded braid. Yeah, are there any questions so far about how this works? So far, something? Yeah. Reasonable? All right. Great. So the integers come with this wonderful element called zero, which acts as the identity. And um, any self-respecting thing that calls itself a group, like the braid groups, better have an identity. All right. And um, Sure enough, there is a identity braid. And it's just this braid. All right, it's a braid where the strands just go straight down. And what do I mean by identity here is that if you take that braid, if you take that identity braid and put it above any other braid, that braid doesn't change. Right? Because you're allowed to stretch and squish, it doesn't change sort of what's crossing and what's not crossing. Same if you put it below another braid, it's not crossing, right? So we know that sort of this star, anything else. Right, it doesn't change what the thing is that you're doing the concatenation with. And if you're bored, you can try to figure out well, how inverses work, right? So I hand you a braid, I claim that there is an inverse. So there's another braid which you can concatenate with the braid you started with, such that when you put them together, you just get the identity back. Yeah, that's a fun little exercise. Okay, so those are braids and that's the braid group. So like, so like the inverses, I guess you want to kind of undo them crossing by crossing. Is there something clever that you could do where you just like flip the two planes somehow? Yeah, so kind of. So you can imagine, let's have a look at this braid over here, this one in the middle. And um, imagine there was a mirror here. Yeah. So if I draw the mirror image, this is a mirror. If I draw the mirror image, I get something that looks like this. Oh, and that'll undo all the crossings for you. And that'll undo everything for you. So in general, if you want to find an inverse, you just put a mirror at the bottom of the braid and you have a look at what the reflection looks like. And that's going to be a perfectly good braid. And when you compose them, everything will undo itself. Is kind of neat. Cool. Indeed. All right. So section two. Braids. So here's another way of looking at braids. I could look at homeomorphisms, and I'll tell you what those are in a second. Of the following thing. Okay, so what I've drawn here is a disk. All I've got is I, I've got a disk, uh, sort of, you can imagine it's colored in, right? So it's like a two-dimensional object here. Okay, And I've got some marked points. I've marked points 
I've marked three points along the middle of the disk. And when I say homeomorphisms of the disk, that means I'm just looking for a continuous bijection, right, from the disk to itself that preserves the marked points. So the marked points have to get sent to themselves, but maybe they're, um, maybe they're permuted. Okay, so there's a map from the disk to the disk, and how do we sort of denote, how do we pay attention to what the homeomorphism is doing? Well, here's how I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna draw these three arcs, and I'm just gonna draw what happens to them on the other side, right? So there's some map of the disk to itself. It's mixing stuff up, it's moving things around, right? And maybe what it does to these arcs is it does the following. Maybe it sort of moves the arcs around. So what's happened here is that these, the first two points on the left have sort of been moved around each other. They've been squished and stretched around each other. And here is what the arcs look like after you've done the homeomorphism. Right. Now you might object and say, well, these arcs, it's all well and good to know where those arcs go, but that doesn't tell me where everything else goes. And it turns out we don't actually care where everything else goes because we're not looking at homeomorphisms on the nose. We're going to look at homeomorphisms up to isotopy, right? which effectively is just stretching and squishing. Okay, so what do I mean by that? Is that this homeomorphism that I've drawn up there This homeomorphism is the same homeomorphism as this one. So I start with my arcs here, and then maybe something like this happens. But up to sort of stretching and squishing my arcs, Leaving those points fixed, the points aren't allowed to move, right? Up to stretching and squishing my arcs, I'm going to think of these two homeomorphisms as the same because the arcs just get sent to the same place after I do some stretching and squishing. Okay. So these are equal. These are equal in our braid group B3, right? Except, you know how in the world do you see these as braids at all is the question well we're going to define so let me make the definition in general and then we'll talk about why it's the same as the definition i gave before so bn is going to be homeomorphisms of the disks so just continuous maps from the disk to itself with n marked points on it except it's up to isotopy, right? So you can just draw those arcs and that's good enough to tell you what the homeomorphism is or what the element of the break group is. Cool. So here's the big question now is sort of, why are these the same? Why did I call this a break group and why did I call what came before the break group? And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to show you how to translate between both of these pictures, right? both of these ways of looking at the braid group. So let's just we'll call this translation. So here's how you would translate between these two sort of pictures. So I'm going to start with the braid. I'm going to start with a braid and around the top points, I'm going to draw a disc. And around the bottom points, I'm going to draw a disc. So now you should think of this as like the braid, the strand diagram is living inside a cylinder. And the top disc is the top face of the cylinder. The bottom disc is the bottom face of the cylinder. 
And now I'm going to allow the top disc to just drop, drop through the cylinder. And as it goes, those marked points are going to get dragged along by the strands. All right, so let's see this in action. So I start with my disc diagram at the top. And then as I drop down, I get this intermediary sort of picture, this snapshot of what's going on, which maybe now looks like something like that, right? The, the, the purple arcs are getting dragged along as you go down the story, as you go down in the movie. And then at the bottom, you end up with this arc diagram. So what is this telling me? This is telling me that this element in B3, sorry, this element here in B3, this translates back and forth with the homeomorphism given by the arc diagram. Like that. Okay, so we've got this sort of notion of braids as strand diagrams, as braids. And you've got this notion of braids as sort of homeomorphisms of a disk, ways to describe how we're moving a disk around. Okay. Are there any questions about this at all? There's, there's some kind of like sneakiness. I mean, this, this is like kind of like an algebraic topology thing where specifying just a very small amount of info on the disk is enough to specify the whole homeomorphism of the disk. Yeah, so it's, an, it's enough to tell you the homeomorphism of the disk up to isotope. Right. So, you know, I, I'm not going to be, I'm not going to be able to tell you exactly what the map is. But I'm going to tell you that the map is isotopic to something. So I, after, after I do some stretching and squishing of where the map goes, then I know the, the arcs have to look like this. OK. Yeah. All right. So composition in this world, like what's the group operation, right? It has to eat two braids and spit out another braid. Is just you do one homeomorphism and then you do the other one, right? You're just composing functions, just like you would in calculus or something like that. Okay, so um, the operation is simply composition of functions. Great. Any questions about this? Uh, yeah, sorry, go on. It's just a comment. It's beautiful. So, um, no, I, I'm a programmer. In fact, a functional programmer. If you, yeah. try, you reduce anything to functional programming and say, yeah, I just have to compose two functions, I'm happy. Right. Good. I'm glad. <laughs> Excellent. Okay. Section three. Braids. <laughs> okay, what is a braid? So here, here is a braid on four strands. This is a braid of four strands. So in general, BN is the set of words in the following symbols. So I can think of this very sort of combinatorially, very algebraically now. Words in sigma one plus to the power of plus or minus one, sigma two to the power of plus or minus one, up to sigma n minus one to the power of plus or minus one. Okay, so they're just words. And they're going to, so the operation when you have words is just going to be concatenation. So example, 
in B3, sigma 1, sigma 2, sigma 3, sigma 2. You can take this word, you do the following operation, sigma 1 squared, let's say. Well, this is sigma 1, sigma 2, sigma 3, sigma 2, sigma 1 squared. Okay, you're just concatenating the words. Except we want to have some kind of rules as to how we identify words. Because, for example, if you have sigma 1, sigma 2, sigma 2 inverse, we're going to want that to be equal to sigma 1. Okay, now in order for us to figure out what the rules are, in order to actually recover the braid group, we're going to have to figure out what we mean in terms of the braid diagrams when I say sigma one, sigma two, sigma three. Sorry, we're having troubles with my pen. There we go. Okay. So let's have a look at this element, sigma 1, sigma 2, sigma 1 inverse, sigma 2 squared in B3. Here's how we're going to translate this into a braid diagram. Translation into a braid diagram in B3. So every time you see a sigma 1, the first two strands are going to switch. Every time you see a sigma 2, the second and third strand will switch. And in general, Sigma n, you're going to switch to nth and n plus one strand. Okay, so sigma one is going to look like this. And then the next one, sigma two. And then the next one, sigma one inverse. So it's going to be sigma one, but switching in the opposite direction. And then the next one is sigma two squared. So it's going to be sigma two and then sigma two again. We've got a slight typo, which is that sigma three isn't in B3. Sigma three. Yeah. Are you talking about this last one? No, you're there. Uh, oh, sorry. Let's go that in B4, sure. Yeah, great. Okay, perfect. <laughs> <laughs> great. Okay. Good. okay. So this is how you translate between the words and the um, braid diagrams. So now let's try and figure out what rules we need. So let's have a look at this. So in in B4, Let's look at these two braids. So that's sigma one and this is sigma three. And it doesn't really matter what order I do sigma one and sigma three in, right? I could have done sigma three first and then sigma one. These two braids in B4 are going to be equal because the crossings somehow don't interact with each other. So sigma one, sigma three should be equal to sigma three, sigma one. And this kind of thing should happen in general. Okay, so. I'm going to I'm going to keep track of the information we're discovering. So BN is going to be the set of all words in sigma 1 up to sigma n minus 1 and its inverses subject to the following rules. sigma i sigma j equals sigma j sigma i as long as the i's and j's are far enough apart. So if you're switching like these two over here and these two way over here, there's no interaction with them. So it doesn't matter what order you do to flip it. It doesn't matter what order you do to little twist it. But if they interact, something interesting goes on. 
So let's have a look at this. Let's investigate this some more. So sigma one, sigma two, sigma one, Well, this is going to be equal to, I can imagine taking this middle strand, which is sort of bulging out to the left, grabbing it and passing it through, making it bulge out on the right, passing it through the middle two, the, the outside two strands. All right, so this is gonna end up being sigma two, sigma one, sigma two. Uh, Oh, this is the wrong, sorry, I've, I've done these crossings wrong. Sigma one, sigma two. That's better. Okay, so I'll let you stare at that for a sec. Well, what's going on is that the middle strand, the one that's going straight down and sort of bulging out to the left, I'm just pulling it through and it's bulging out to the right now. And then if I write down the words corresponding to these, you get that relation. All right, so I'm gonna go up and add that rule. So sigma i, sigma i plus one, sigma i is equal to sigma i plus one, sigma i, sigma i plus one. Right. For all i one up to n minus two. And this here, this is called the braid relation. So here's an amazing fact, is that all the information about braid groups, all the information about braids, all the sliding and switching around that you can do is completely, is completely encapsulated in these two rules, right? There's this obvious rule for when twists are far enough apart. And then there's the braid relation. And that's it. That's all you need to completely define the braid group. So miraculously, these are all the rules you need. By the way, the braid relation comes up a ton in mathematics. It's all over the place. Um, for example, we'll do a little aside here. I take those two matrices, then it turns out that ABA equals BAB. This is, these things satisfy the braid relation. They come up in topology all the time. It comes up in algebra. It's very common thing that just sort of shows it's rears its head when you least expect it. Okay, so those are braid groups. Are there any questions about sort of the three perspectives here? Uh, oh, can you go just back to braid relation? Uh, it's not, okay, cool. Uh, yeah, I'm just gonna scribble that down. Yeah, yeah, of course. Okay, got it. Thank you. And if you've taken a course and if you've seen symmetric groups or taken a group theory course, it turns out that if you introduce another set of relations where you take sigma i squared is the identity for every single i, then you just recover the symmetric group. Mm. Okay. So if you insist that every, you twist twice and that becomes the identity, then you're just dealing with the symmetric group. Oh, nice. Which is an interesting thing to sort of rectify in your head. Okay. So I want to ask an interesting question about braid groups. So it's probably never happened to you if you've had the privilege of braiding someone's hair. It's probably never happened to you that you've picked a pattern while braiding. Usually there's sort of a standard, there's a standard pattern you pick when you braid, which is sigma one. Sigma two inverse. 
this is usually the pattern you, you do when you break it. You do that over and over again. Sigma one, sigma two inverse. This is how you make a standard three-stranded break. Right? It's probably never happened that you pick some pattern and you do it over and over again. And then suddenly after you do it like eight times, you there's no braid. It's like completely undone itself. All right. This I, I mean, this seems like a ridiculous thing to happen. So let's ask if it actually does happen in terms of mathematics, right? So how do you formalize this? So is there a braid? B not equal to the identity such that so that b to the n is the identity or b to the let's call it k b to the k is the identity for some k is it possible that you could have a brain which you did over and over again and then once you've done it say 22 times you've just unraveled everything this is somehow this there's what's called torsion if you're familiar with that term okay so ie another way to ask this is bn what's called torsion free torsion free right and you, and you can take that to be the definition of being torsion free is that if you have a non-trivial braid, then every power of it is non-trivial. This doesn't always happen in group theory, right? If you think of the integers mod three, for example, if you take one and add it to itself three times, you get zero, right? That's like taking a braid and doing it three times and then getting the identity. Okay, so in order to investigate this question, it seems like an obvious thing, like no way, there's no braid that does this, but you know, obvious things can sometimes be false, so you have to prove them. So in order to sort of attack this question, we're gonna take our inspiration from something a little more familiar. Let's take inspiration. from the integers with plus. Okay. So the integers with plus, so the identity in the integers with plus is zero. Right? Zero is the identity element. But if you take any non-zero element and add it to itself, or you take seven and add it to itself, if you keep adding it to itself, it never magically becomes zero. Right? In fact, this is true for all non-zero elements. So, What's special about the integers, right? Like what makes this work? Because we're going to try and take whatever makes this work and abstract it away into braid groups and try to imitate that with the braid group. Yeah, I, I sort of feel like what happens is you, you can like look at, if you're non-trivial, if these non-trivial, you, you have two strands, some have a wrap around each other in B. And just given those two strands, I can say, okay, like how many times have they gone around each other? Yeah. So and then yeah. For two strands, that's for sure true. That works. But um, when you have more than two strands, it turns out you have to do something a little more complicated. Right. right. So, yeah. But let's have a look at what's going on with the integers, right? So it turns out that there's this axiom for the integers. So here's an important axiom when you define the integers. So there's an axiomatic way to define the integers. And it's like a set with some operations, blah, blah, blah. And one of the properties is that there is a subset P such that. So there's some subset of the integers that has the following properties. If A and B are both in P, then A plus B is in P. And for all integers, A is in P or A is in negative P. Sorry, I'll actually write it, I'll write it a little differently. Or minus A is in P or A equals zero. And exactly one of them is true, right? So these are all exclusive ors. So another way I can write this 
is that Z is a disjoint union of P and zero and negative P. Okay. And we call it P because these are the positive integers. So if you look at the positive integers, it satisfies this. If you take two positive integers and add them together, you're positive. And every integer is either positive, it's negative is positive, or it's zero. Okay. So the integers mod n, for example, doesn't have a subset with this property. And it turns out that the existence of this is exactly what's making z torsion free. It's exactly what's making z have this property that you can add that when you add a non-trivial element to itself, it never comes back to zero. Okay, so another way of thinking about this property is that we can now define an ordering that A is less than B if, you know, A, B minus A is in P. This is how you define the usual ordering on the integers. Is that A is less than B, or less than or equals to, let's say. No, less than is what I want. If and only if. Right. And this ordering plays nicely with addition, right? And addition is what we started with. So, and it turns out that A plus C, sorry, A is less than or equal to B if and only if like A plus C is less than A plus B plus C. So you can add anything to both sides and the inequality stays valid. What this allows you to do is put the integers on a line somehow. This allows you to construct the integers and visualize them as being on a line. But this is zero, one, two, blah, 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 minus one, minus two, the familiar old number line. And this here is P, this here is minus P, and this here is zero. Okay. So the existence of some subset like this P exactly tells you that it can be, you can put integers on the line. And it exactly tells you that if you add something to itself a bunch of times, if it's not zero, it's never going to be zero. We're going to try and do the same thing for break groups. So, um, yep, natural question. Can we do this for break groups? And the answer, of course, is going to be yes. But before we go and show you how we do this, are there any questions about this sort of mysterious P or this positive, this existence of a subset or something like this? Um, yeah. When you state A in P or minus A in P or A equals zero, do you also add mutual exclusion? Yeah, this is exclusive. This is mutually exclusive. So this, let me just put a little note here. Exactly one of these is true. You can't have any intersection between those. Yeah, and that's exactly this like square bracket thing here. Disjoint union. Okay, so we're looking for a subset of braids, which are somehow positive, and a subset of braids, which is somehow negative. And here's how you do it. This is kind of a really remarkable thing. It's very easy once you have it shown to you, and I think it would be very hard to come up with next to impossible, actually. So we're going to let... Let P... In the end, be the set of right veering rates. Okay, what do I mean by this? So I will show you what a right veering braid is in terms of some examples. So let's take 
the brain group on three strands, except I'm going to view it as homeomorphisms of the disk up to isotopy. Okay. So if I have a non-trivial braid, at some point, these arcs are going to diverge from just going horizontally across. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start at the edge, right at the boundary of the disk, and start walking along the first arc. If the first arc stays where it is, great. I'm going to keep, and then I'm going to walk along the second arc. And the second one might diverge. It doesn't just go straight across. So it either goes left or right. right? If I follow this along, it either goes left or right. And from that, you can define whether or not a braid is right veering or not. So this one here, the first thing that happens is my arc veers to the right. So this one is going to be in P. This one here, the first time I have any sort of diversion from the horizontal, it goes to the right. So this one's also in P. And then this one, well, the first time I had any diversion from the horizontal, it actually be at left. So this is going to not be in P. And here's a beautiful theorem from a bunch of mathematicians. Ralphson, Rourke, and Bert Wiest from 1999. And it says the following, is that if you have two braids, X and Y are in P, then the product of them, X star Y, is also in P. Right, so if you have two braids which veer to the right and you multiply them together, then they also veer to the right. And Bn is you can look at every braid is either left veering or right veering, or it's the identity. Yeah, I've got a there's something in the chat here. Oh, that was our one step leaps of adjacent nodes. Sorry, Andy, I don't understand your question. I think the question is about what does a VRA mean? Oh, yeah, so. That seems to be the answer. Yeah. I mean, you're just sort of looking, you go along your arcs and then you either have to veer to the left or the right first. It's a good name because it tells you exactly what we're talking about, right? We go, you're veering to the, you're going off path to the left or to the right. Okay, and so if you have a group, anytime you have a group with these two properties, it's called the left orderable group. BN is left orderable. And what it allows you to do is prove that, so here you have a corollary, is that Bn is torsion free. Which exactly means that if you were braiding someone's hair and you picked a pattern, it doesn't matter how many times you do it, it would never just unravel itself, right? The hair would never just come undone and become just like an unbraided hair in front of you. Okay. So let's talk about how you would how you would prove this. Right. So I'll just sketch out a little proof here. Proof. You take B and B N, non-trivial. If B is in P, then B to the N is in P. Sorry, B to the K, let's say. For all um, K 
K positive. Right. So anything in the positive cone, because two things in P have to multiply to give you something in P, you're never going to end up with the identity. And then you make a similar argument, similar argument for B in P inverse, then B to the K is in P inverse. Or all K bigger than zero. And that's basically it, right? There's not much to it. Once you have this property that there is a positive cone and there is a negative cone. So you can take your braid group and you can visualize it as sitting on the line. And this is P. These are all the right veering braids. These are all the left veering braids. Right veering. And the braid group consists entirely of these things and the identity. And that is a good place to stop. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, thank you, thank you. that's awesome. Um, sweet, so we have a bit of a tradition for the people who are bringing online um, part of the seminar. For the people who are here in person, please fill out the uh, muffins form. It is very important. Uh, for people who are online, thank you for coming out. If you could fill in the little survey that I just put in the chat, that would be much appreciated. Send the feedback on to Chai. Okay, let's take a couple moments for that. If you've got any questions, think about them for a moment. We'll let the people fill out the form. Sorry, what's the I can't hear the question. So if you have a positive P and take a negative power. Oh, then you will end up in P inverse. That's correct. Okay. Yeah, so the only power of a non-trivial element that can be an identity is zero. Yeah. Hi, I, I had a question. Yeah. So the set P that you mentioned, so it doesn't always exist, but like, let's say if it does exist, is it unique or is there like other options? No, there are uncountably many positive cones you could choose on the very group, it turns out. Oh, okay. But this is a, this is a particular nice one. That's easy okay. to find. Yeah. What yeah. about the integers? Like, would there be other P's for the integers? There's, there's only two you can choose for the integers. One of them's the negatives, and one of them's the positive. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. Interesting. So you can try to prove that. I mean, that's it doesn't require much, but if you want, you want a P that satisfies these properties. And you can prove that the only two such subsets are the negatives and the positives. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Well, no problem. Then uh, can you put the brace on the and order? Yeah, so when you have a when you have a um a P that satisfies this, right, these properties, you can always say that like um, X is less than Y if and only if um, X inverse Y is in P. So now you have this ordering and you show that this ordering satisfies, you know, it plays nicely with the group operation. So you always have that ZX less than ZY. So if you have X is less than Y, that's ZX is going to be less than ZY for all Z. So with this, that means you can imagine that the braids live on a line, and when you multiply by something, the line just gets shifted around, but the ordering of anything doesn't change. It just gets pushed back and forth, just like the integers. Yeah. 
so so what what's what's your interest in grades? I mean, this is this is really nice, but how does this come up for you? I mean, this is so this orderability stuff is sort of part of uh, a big part of what I do in terms of research. Uh, I deal with orderable groups a lot, and grade groups are a really nice example of orderable groups. Uh, but I also, you know, I also deal with mapping class groups, which are a generalization of this, of the homeomorphism way of looking at braid groups. Um, for this definition of the homeomorphism, this is called the, this here is called the mapping class group. Right, and you can have like mapping class groups of surfaces and stuff, and they'll end up not being as nice as a braid group, but braid exactly. groups well studied nice yeah. break groups break groups also uh, rock up in mapping class groups of higher of off surfaces and high dimensional manifolds and this kind of thing yeah yeah so i i mean i have got a i've got a paper about embedding break groups into mapping class groups in interesting ways and this kind of stuff I, i've played with them a lot i think they're a really beautiful group uh, there's lots of fun to yeah just get stuck into them there's so much there that you could do. Well, thank you very much, folks. This is yeah, this is, this is a great talk. Um, our speaker uh, for next week canceled this morning, so it is unclear what seminar will look like uh, next week. I'll keep everyone updated by email. Um, in two weeks, we have a speaker who is not canceled yet. Um, let's have a look at who's up next. Oh, oh, that's all capitals. That's the point. Uh, right. So in two weeks on June 14th, we've got Daniel Demo who will tell us about descriptive set theory. Uh, big topology background there. Looks like it's going to be a good one. Um, Zach Walski has canceled for next week. Uh, so we'll see if we can find another speaker. That'll keep better enough. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much for coming in. Thank you, Tyler. It was an awesome talk. Um, good luck, Billy. Did you know Uh It's nice to have met you through this. Yeah, likewise. Thanks very much for having me.